Hi everyone, today, I have another video about the top 10 useful modules from China. I won't be covering just anything, but only modules that cost no more than $1. First, let me note that I'll only be looking at relatively new and interesting modules. So, we'll be skipping the popular TP4056 charger and the NT3608 converter. Everyone already knows about those anyway. I'll only be showing modules that I've personally tested. For many of them, I've made separate video reviews and posted them on my second channel. You'll find links to those reviews, as well as links to buy the featured modules, in the description. I'll start the review with charging modules, and right now, in front of you is probably the most compact module for charging classic lithium-ion batteries. This thing is designed to be built into miniature devices like Bluetooth headsets, hearing aids, electronic styluses, and all sorts of small remotes. The charger is only suitable for regular lithium-ion batteries. It charges the battery using the correct method, constant current, constant voltage. The charge termination voltage is 4.2 volts. There is an indicator for the charging process. The board is based on the LP4054 chip. The maximum charging current is 600 milliamps, but it can be changed by selecting the current setting resistor, just like with the popular TP4056. The board is not afraid of short circuits, the current is reset, and the module can remain in this state indefinitely. The downside is that this is a linear charger, and the chip itself can heat up to 100 degrees depending on the charging current. But The module has a Type-C connector, and most of the heat will be dissipated through the power cable. Plus, the chip itself has temperature control, and if it gets too hot, it will reduce the current to avoid failure. Overall, it's a pretty smart device. I didn't notice any issues with its operation. So if you need a dirt-cheap lithium charger, one that's as small as it gets, this thing will do the job. It's important to note that this is strictly a charger. In other words, it does not function as a BMS. The second module is also a charger, but not a simple one. It's about twice the size of the previous option, but it's a full-fledged power bank board. Yeah, it's a compact power bank module like this. So, the board can charge a battery and boost its voltage to charge gadgets. Again, it's designed to work with a single-cell lithium battery. It charges the battery using the correct method up to a voltage of 4.2 volts. It provides low voltage protection, short circuit protection, and charge indication. The indication isn't simple. There are three LEDs here. A couple of them show which mode the board is in, whether it's boosting and supplying current to a load, or charging the internal battery. The third indicator shows the charge level by a sequence of flashes. The maximum charging current is 2.4 amps. The output current, when operating as a boost converter, is also rated up to 2.4 amps, but it struggles to deliver more than 2 amps. The converter is synchronous, with high efficiency. It's built around the ETA9742 chip. It's also a pretty advanced chip. This is a good option if you're looking for a compact power bank module with high efficiency and decent output characteristics. There are no fast charging protocols here. The maximum output is 5 volts. Type-C, of course, is bidirectional. It works both for charging the battery and for charging your gadgets. The next board is a charging system for nickel metal hydride and nickel cadmium batteries. These kinds of alkaline batteries in AA or AAA format are still very popular, despite the availability of lithium alternatives. Of course, there are specialized chargers made for them, but this board is much more versatile. The main advantage is that it can charge assemblies from 1 to 8 cells, and it's suitable for charging both individual cells and battery packs. The module can be powered by anything from 4.5 to 5.5 volts, meaning it works with a standard USB, which is pretty convenient. The charging current for the batteries is 230 to 240 milliamps. In addition, it has short circuit protection, reverse polarity protection, and charge indication. The chip is quite smart and charges the battery using the correct method, in this case by the delta method. If the battery is deeply discharged, the module will charge it with currents of about 100 milliamps. Charging at the maximum current will start when the voltage on the cell is above 1 volt. The number of cells in series is set by a pair of resistors. Overall, I have only positive impressions of the board. And this tiny module here is designed for building homemade 1.5 volt batteries using a lithium-ion cell. That is, you can connect any lithium battery to the input, and you'll always get 1.5 volts at the output. Plus, you don't need a separate charging system, the module can charge the lithium battery from a 5 volt source. There's also a charge indicator. The module's features are as follows, it charges a lithium battery with a current of up to 400 milliamps. 
At the output, with a voltage of 1.5 volts, it can deliver a current of up to half an ampere steadily, even though more is claimed. For power-hungry loads, that's of course not a lot, but remotes, mice, and even relatively demanding devices will work. The coolest thing is that the consumption from the battery in standby mode is only 2 to 3 microamps. That is, it practically consumes nothing, so you can and should leave it connected to the battery. It has short circuit protection, battery protection from overcharging, deep discharge, and much more. It doesn't heat up much even at maximum currents, and that's thanks to synchronous conversion. And also, the module can charge from 5 volts while simultaneously outputting its 1.5 volts. I really like this module a lot and can definitely recommend it. I think all of you are quite familiar with popular linear regulators like the 7805. It's a simple solution if you need to lower the voltage to a certain value. There are regulators with a fixed voltage, and there are adjustable ones, like the LM317. Their main drawback is their linear mode of operation. The greater the difference between the input and output voltage and the higher the output current, the more losses are dissipated as heat in the chip. The Chinese have switching analogs of such chips. In terms of size and pin layout, they match classic linear regulators in a 2220 package. These things are great because they're pretty versatile. So, for example, if you buy a regulator for 5 volts, you can tweak the resistor divider and set any output voltage you want. The maximum output current is up to 1 ampere. As a rule, they're built around the Mi 3116 chip or similar ones. It's a standard non-synchronous buck converter, but the efficiency is much higher than that of linear regulators. By the way, the efficiency is somewhere between 75 and 90 percent. It will get hot, sometimes up to 100 or 110 degrees, the chip itself but it can operate for a long time without a cooling heatsink. The output voltage can be up to 40 volts. It has short circuit protection on the output. And what about ripple? About 50 millivolts peak to peak at a maximum current of 1 ampere without any additional filters or power supply capacitors. Of course, in this regard, they can't compare to linear regulators at all. But, let's be honest, 50 millivolts isn't all that much for such a simple converter. And in a circuit where there are capacitors at the input and output, the ripple will be much lower. For ultra-sensitive loads, of course, linear regulators are the way to go. For everything else, this one will do just fine. The ideal diode. You've probably heard about them. The whole point is that regular diodes have losses at the junction, and as the current increases, these losses go up. These losses cause the diode to heat up and reduce the overall efficiency of the system. Even Schottky diodes, which have a small voltage drop at the junction, still heat up. And that's all because, as I mentioned earlier, as the current increases, the voltage drop also increases. An ideal diode is, in fact, a field effect transistor operating in switching mode, which is often controlled by a specialized microchip. This chip ensures the key is fully and properly turned on when needed, and reliably turned off as well. Field effect transistors have a parameter called on resistance, which is measured in ohms. Nowadays, you can easily find switches with this resistance as low as half a milliohm or even less, and for a reasonable price. For comparison, let's take a very powerful shock key diode from Vichy. The graph on the datasheet shows that at a current of 50 amps, the voltage drop will be about 0.4 volts at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. That's about 20 watts of loss at 50 amps. And by the way, this is with a high-end diode. As a competitor, let's take a tiny MOSFET with a long name. Its drain current is about 100 amps, and that's limited by the package. So, at the same 50 amp current, the MOSFET's on resistance is 0.56 milliohms. Taking that into account, the losses will be 1.4 watts, which is more than an order of magnitude less. Now compare their sizes. The diode is the bigger one. And this is one of those cases where size doesn't matter. I think it's clear now why this kind of ideal diode is so effective. Mainly, ideal diodes are used to provide power isolation in high current, low voltage circuits and for reverse polarity protection. They're often used together with solar panels for paralleling power sources in chargers and so on. They operate with almost no losses and hardly heat up at all. Ultra miniature charge indicators for lithium ion batteries. I recommend using these things only where space is extremely limited and there's no way to use a proper charge indicator. They're designed to work with a single classic lithium cell. Their main feature is just one thing, compact size. It has four indicator LEDs. They're placed too close together. It's hard to tell how many LEDs are lit, especially if your eyesight isn't great. 
But the chip the indicator is built on is pretty smart. It maintains hysteresis using a special algorithm. And the algorithm is different depending on whether the battery is charging or discharging. RCWL0516 module. This is a popular microwave motion sensor based on the Doppler effect. Unlike regular sensors, like IR sensors, a Doppler sensor is super sensitive and all seen. It emits a microwave signal and analyzes the reflection from moving objects. Thanks to this, it can detect even the slightest movements. It's impossible to pass by a Doppler sensor unnoticed. It can even see through walls, glass, and plastic. It's immune to environmental conditions, and its operating temperature range is from minus 20 to plus 80 degrees Celsius. The module's supply voltage range is from 4 to 28 volts, with a current consumption of up to 3 milliamps. The operating frequency is 3.18 gigahertz. The detection range is from 5 to 9 meters. The range can be adjusted by selecting the specified resistor. The module supports installing a photoresistor if you want the sensor to work only at night. With a sensor like this and a regular Arduino, you can build an excellent security alarm system. But there are also drawbacks. It reacts to any movement, can't distinguish a person from other objects, and generally can't tell cold from warm objects. Triggering through walls is also a drawback in many cases. It is sensitive to radio waves. But despite all this, considering how cheap it is, it's definitely worth playing around with the sensor. Nowadays, phone chargers aren't just simple 5-volt adapters. They're sophisticated power sources with multiple converters inside, smart chips, support for a bunch of fast charging protocols, and can provide output voltages from 5 to 20 volts, and in some cases up to 28. A charger rated at 65, 100, or even more watts is no longer a novelty. But the thing is, by default, these chargers only output a safe 5 volts. The device itself has a trigger inside, and the charger only provides more if the device requests it. But what if you need to get more than 5 volts from the charger? For such cases, the Chinese have small trigger boards. They come in different voltages. There are also these universal triggers that request various voltages from the power adapter. The required voltage is set by a specific combination of switches. Usually, these are the standard voltages, 9, 12, 15, and 20 volts. At the same time, the charger will provide the maximum current. There are advanced triggers that let you set intermediate values, but they are much more expensive. And a universal trigger like this costs less than a dollar. It has a Type-C input, and the output is two pads where you can solder wires. If you really want to, you can request 20 volts from the charger. Then, for example, you can solder a step-down current and voltage regulator like this to the trigger's output, set the output voltage to, say, 14.4 volts and the current to about 3 to 5 amps, and charge a car battery. Of course, your adapter must be able to deliver the required power. That's pretty much everything I wanted to share today. Give this video a like or a dislike. Leave a comment and share your thoughts. And with that, I'll say goodbye. As always, this was Kazianaka with you. See you next time. Bye.